church at Galatia. So what has happened so far? So somebody has come in to the church. Paul has already preached the gospel to the church at Galatia. And then somebody has come in and has gotten them, has perverted the gospel, has, te has taught a gospel of works-based salvation to these people. And the church or, you know, people in the church are believing it. So Paul is giving... Uh, you know, a defense of the gospel in the book of Galatians. He is first, you know, came in in the first chapter and said, you know, anybody that comes in and perverts the gospel or preaches anything else, he says, even if I come to you and preach a different gospel, he says, you're not to believe it, let that person be accursed. So then, of course, in Galatians chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 2, we saw this idea that, uh, you know, to be children of Abraham, you know, the Jews, they thought, you know, that, you know, they were, they were special because they were heirs of Abraham. And Paul teaches us in Galatians chapter 3 that anybody who has the faith, Abraham was saved through faith, and anybody that has that same faith, that believes that same gospel, the gospel that was given to Abraham, is an heir of Abraham. So we continue that thought in Galatians chapter 4, and then Paul, right away in the first few verses here, he starts to add another aspect or another twist to um, the lesson that he's teaching the Galatians. So look down at Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 1. And the Bible says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. So here he's taking this idea that we're all heirs through faith, you know, that same faith. We're all heirs of Abraham. Jesus said the same thing. I am able to raise up of these rocks children of Abraham. He said that to the, the arrogant Pharisees who were, you know, thinking that they were something because of, you know, their heritage. But he says that the heir, so now we know we're all heirs. If you're saved, you're an heir of Abraham. As long as he is a child, differ nothing, differ nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. So he, he, he injects this different idea. He says, okay, so you're an heir, you're a child. He's like, but look, but children in the world, you know, they're servants. He's like, even, even any person in the world is under, you know, some kind of, you know, leadership from tutors and governors. So he says, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So everybody, he says, as an heir, as a child, is in bondage under, you know, the system of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you're, ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. So we know that we've been adopted. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, than an heir of God through Christ. So he's saying, look, you're, you're children of Abraham, you're an heir of Abraham. He's like, but look, if you were, you were, if, it's further than that. He's like, there's a spiritual aspect where when you got saved through Christ, you became adopted by God. You're an actual heir of God, and you're free through that. He's like, you're not going to be free by being an heir of Abraham. You're free by being adopted by God, is what he's saying. So he injects this idea of, bondage versus freedom. And not only are you an heir of Abraham, but you're actually an heir of God, and you're free because of that. Okay, you're free because God has adopted you. Look at verse number nine. I'm sorry, verse number eight. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather, this is interesting, turn to Matthew chapter seven, but he says, after that ye have known God, or rather, he kind of like catches himself and says, or rather are known of God. Now how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. So he's comparing this idea of this new belief that they had, that this new belief that the church is adopting in works to being back in bondage. He's saying, look, he's like, ye have known God, or rather are known of God, and that's interesting. Look at Matthew 7, verse 22. Just that, that phrase, are known of God. Because what that means is this. In Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse number 22, the Bible says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name cast out devils, and thy name done many wonderful works? These were people that knew who God was and were calling Jesus Lord, but were bragging about their works. They were boasting. 
And in verse 23, the Bible says, And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So you see, it's really, that's why that second phrase in verse number 9 of Galatians chapter 4 is so important, because it's really about God knowing you. It's not about us knowing God. It's whether or not He knows you. That's the important one in the Bible. Go back to Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 10. So he's saying that by them, by them, you know, they're turning again to the beggarly, they're turning again to the world, basically, is what he's saying, and they're putting themselves in bondage by doing that. So we see in these first few verses this idea of works based salvation being compared to bondage, and, you know, the true gospel being compared to freedom. Okay, so this, that's what I want you to get from these first few verses here. Okay, you're not, only, you're not an heir of the world anymore, you're an heir of God if you're saved. You're an heir of God, your Father, you're adopted by Him, and because of that, you're free. Okay, you're no longer in bondage. So he's saying, why are you, you wanting to go back into bondage? He's like, why are you turning to be in bondage when you have freedom right there? Look at Galatians chapter 4, and verse number 10. And then he says, and he gets specific. He gets specific about some of the, the, the silly you know, things that they're doing. In verse number 10, he says, "Ye observe days and months and times and years. He says, I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. Look, he, what he's saying here is, turn to Romans chapter 14 while I'm explaining this. But what he's saying is, they're observing all these festivals and they're observing all the Old Testament days and, and you know, all the different... Sabbaths and all this different thing. They're observing all these things. And he says, I'm afraid of you. He's basically saying like, uh, I mean, it's kind of the equivalent, modern day equivalent of saying like, are you guys a bunch of morons or what's going on here? You know, he's like, what in the world? He's like, I mean, if I would have known you were this, you know, unintelligent, I maybe wouldn't have spent so much time with you in the first place. <laughs> it's kind of what he's saying in uh, verse number 11. He's like, lest I bestowed, he's like, I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor. I've wasted my time with you people. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Okay, look at Romans 14 and verse number 5. Let's look at this days and months and times and years. Romans 14, 5, the Bible says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. This answers the whole question of, you know, remember the, you know, the clash of cultures? I mean, who's Romans? You know, he's written, it's geared to the Romans, okay? It's for everybody, but it's geared to the Romans. He's talking to Gentiles here, and he's saying, look, he's like, you got these cultures, and they all have all these different holidays and all these different festivals and all these different things that they celebrate. He's like, look, Whatever man, you know, wants to celebrate whatever, it doesn't make any difference. But he, he says in, in verse number 6, he says that he that regardeth the day, regardeth it, as long as you regard it unto the Lord, is what he's saying. So, don't, you know, you can't have a day where you're worshiping some other god. But he says, look, as long as, you know, you have some, you know, day in your culture and you, you choose to keep that day and you regard it to the Lord, he's like, fine, okay? And then he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. He that giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. So look, what were the Galatians doing here? What was going on here that, you know, the, Paul was bringing this specific thing up? They were, they were following all the holy days. Somebody had come in and was telling them of, as part of this works-based gospel that they needed to follow all these holy days to be either more justified or, you know, justified in general. It, it was tying it to salvation. And they were saying that these things were required. I mean, if they were required, you think James would have brought it up to the Gentiles in, you know, Acts. But he didn't. It obviously is not the case. Look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 12. And Paul goes on. And he says, Brethren, I beseech you. He's like, I beg you. Be as I am, for I am as ye are, and ye have not injured me at all. Know ye no... Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. So he's saying, he says to them, he's like, look, when I was with you at the first time, now we don't know like, if this was Paul's thorn in his flesh that he's talking about here. Maybe he was sick when he was there the first time or he was injured or whatever. But he's like, and my temptation which, is in, which was in my flesh, my test that was in my flesh, you despised not nor rejected, 
but receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So he came there the first time, and he was injured, wounded, sick, whatever, and he's like, you didn't reject me because of that. He must have been, you know, put out to some degree to mention it here, but he's like, you accepted me as Christ Jesus. Wherein, where, verse 15, where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you'd have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. He's just, he's just kind of shocked at this point that he was there and they esteemed him so highly, even in the condition that he was in, that they would just turn so easily. I mean, he's kind of offended. He's kind of offended. Imagine somebody that came here and preached and built a ministry and then comes back six months later, a year later, and it's just completely gone into heresy. No one has stood up for the truth. And it's just people, the wolves have just taken over the entire church. I mean, he's, he's offended. And then he says in verse 16, Am I therefore you become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I mean, he's kind of rebuking them and he's saying, Look, you know, are, are, am I still this blessed person? that you know you you were just fawning all over and just listening to every word i said or am i now am i your enemy now they zealously affect you but not well yea they would exclude exclude you that you might affect them so he's saying he's like these people that came in he's like i mean they must have been some charismatic people they came in and they were very convincing and they really they zealously affected the church. You could be zealously affected in the wrong direction, is what Paul is saying here. You know, be careful with your emotions. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but he's saying, look, they've, they, they've fired you up. He's like, they've fired you up, and they have, they have got you on fire for a false gospel, is what he's saying. Look at verse 18. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, which is not what they are, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. You know, he's basically saying, I'm going to preach until you get saved. Okay? In verse 20, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. So what he's saying right now in verse number 20, he's basically saying, you know, are you even saved? That's what he's saying to them. He's like, are you even saved? He's like, did, you know, how many times do I have to come back and preach the gospel for you to get saved? Because I, I doubt that you're even saved right now. I mean, Paul is saying that to these people right here. Now you think, okay, well, you know, we really shouldn't doubt people's salvation. But here's the thing. You certainly would. If you went out soul winning and you got somebody saved out soul winning and, you know, they, or you got somebody that you know, you know, you gave them the gospel and they accepted it and, you know, they prayed and they asked God to save them. I mean, you would think, all right, they're saved. But then if you came back, you know, two, three months later and they were just, you know, oh, no, um, we found the Book of Mormon, you know, and, and we really think that the Book of Mormon is what's true. I mean, it's works based salvation. And we think that this is the right thing. I mean, I mean, let's be real. You would doubt that they got saved. You would doubt that they got saved. You would wonder about their salvation. Look at verse 21. Now, he goes into a big explanation, another, you know, um, defense of the gospel here, and, and kind of backs up. He kind of gets out of the, the personal. He was kind of like, you know, he went into a personal thing for a while. Like, you guys... You guys were so excited to have me there, and I was such a blessing to you. And now, I mean, it, do you not even care what I say now? And he goes into that, but now he's going to launch into another biblical defense of the gospel. Look at verse 21. And that's where I want to really focus the sermon this evening. He says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? So now he's talking to the people that have believed this, okay? He's talking to the people that maybe even are preaching this. And he says, Ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? He's like, if you desire to be under the law and you think that you're going to be saved under the law, he's like, you don't even understand the law, is what he's saying. Verse 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. So we're going to start to see why he brought up this idea of works-based salvation having to do with bondage and grace through faith having to do with freedom, being an heir of God. Turn to Genesis chapter 16. So he brings up the story of Abraham and Abraham's two sons. 
one by his wife and the other by, you know, um, his bondmaid, Hagar. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 16 and verse number 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto, thy maid, unto my maid, that it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. He listened to her. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to, husband, to her husband Abram to be his wife. So she actually, you know, he marries her, of course, as, a, as another wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So here, you know, Sarah is not, Sarai in this verse is not able to um, have children. And she's barren, the Bible says. If she bear him no children. And then she says, well, why don't you just go into my, my handmaid, uh, my servant, and have children through her. You know, it's kind of like a, a surrogacy. So he marries her, and then, of course, you know, the, the, the household just doesn't really work out from there, right? I mean, Hagar, you know, despises Sarai, and Hagar ends up having to leave, and, and, and it's a big mess. But the point is, is that that was the first son that Abram had. Now, we'll go back to Galatians chapter 4 in verse number 23. Galatians chapter 4 in verse number 23. So that's the story that verse number 22 was talking about, the one by the bondmaid and the other by a free woman. We haven't seen the one by the free woman yet, but the Bible says in Galatians 4.23, but he who was of the bondwoman, this is Ishmael, um, Hagar's son, was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. So he is saying that when Isaiah is born, um, you know, a few verses later, he's saying that child through Sarai was the child of promise, and the bondwoman, Hagar's son, was a, child, um, it was a child born after the flesh. And I'll explain that to you in a minute, but the Bible says this is an allegory. Okay, it says this is an allegory. So what that means is this story is not only a story that actually happened, but by Paul saying it's an allegory, it means that it's teaching a moral lesson. This is gonna, he's going to use this story to teach a, a deeper meaning, a moral um, meaning here. And I'm going to explain that to you now. And the Bible says this. This is the allegory. allegory. In verse number 25. Or verse 24, these things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. And that's Hagar, of course, in the Old Testament. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Okay, so what he's saying here is that the child through Hagar is an allegory, is a picture of the covenant of Mount Sinai, which of course was the covenant of the law, which of course the Jerusalem, which now is, what was the religion at that time? The Jerusalem that was at that time, they believed in just following the law. And just, you know, they, they thought that they were following the law. They weren't even following the law. But the point is, they believed in works-based salvation. That was, the, that was the religion of the Jews at that time. That just, you know, if we're good and we're religious, you know, we're going to be, you know, going to heaven. Okay? And they're, under, they're in bondage. So he's saying Jerusalem now is in bondage. And that is a picture of Hagar the bondwoman and her son, okay? Because was, he was born after the flesh, okay? Now, this is the current way of the Jews. And it's interesting because these are the type of people that came into the church in Galatia, as we saw a few verses earlier, that these were kind of like Judaizers. They were trying to Judaize the church in Galatia, saying, you need to follow the law. You need to observe the times. You need to observe all the different things that the Jews... Uh, you know, salvation is going to come through Mount Sinai. They're trying to put them underneath the bondage that Jerusalem currently was under, is what the Bible is saying here. And it only brings bondage. And back up to verse number 23, the bond, it was born after the flesh. It's interesting because in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham is, Abram is promised that he will be a great nation. In Genesis chapter 15, 
Abram, and so, you know, God didn't get real specific on that. He just says, I'm going to make you a great nation. He tells him to get out of the land that he's in right now and take this journey. I'm going to make you a great nation. And then in Genesis chapter 15, a, a complete chapter before Ishmael is born and he goes in unto Hagar, God promises him that he's going to have a son from his own bowels, from his own body. God makes that specific promise to him. But what Abram did and what Sarai did was they took God's promise. They're like, you know what? God needs some help. And we're going to do this thing. You know, I know God promised me this thing, but I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it man's way. This is the allegory. Is that Abram, he took, he had the promise of God already. He already had the promise of God, but he said, no, I'm going to do it my way. And that's exactly what works-based salvation is is throwing away the promise of God and saying, no, we're going to do this man's way. And the allegory is that this, and this is what Paul is teaching and why he started out with this idea that you know there's a free air and an a air that's in bondage. Man's way only brings bondage. Is what he is getting at here. Now look at verse number 26. But Jerusalem, so Jerusalem which is now, Jerusalem which is now is in bondage. He's talking about the actual Jerusalem, the actual religion that was going on then. And then verse 26 he says, but Jerusalem which is above is free. This is the heavenly Jerusalem. He's speaking spiritually now. Which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. And he's talking about true salvation. Verse 27, for it is written, rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry. Thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she with hath an husband. Now this is quoting Isaiah 54. Just go ahead and we'll... And it's funny because Isaiah 54 is talking about the same concept of bringing in the Gentiles underneath you know, the adoption of God. Turn to Isaiah. Let's just go there real quickly. Turn to Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah 54 just kind of explains this basic concept in a, in a few verses. Look at, um, this is what Paul is quoting in Galatians 4.27, where it says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, that thou didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither thou shalt be confounded. For thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and thou shalt remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer of the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. Look, anybody is talking about bringing in the whole earth. It's like anybody that is, is an heir that, of faith, is, is, you know, that's how God's going to be the God of everyone on the earth. It's saying the tent, you know, it's not going to be desolate. The tent is going to be bursting at the seams, the Bible says. So that is what Paul is quoting in verse number 27. Look at verse number 28. So look, Abr Abram wanted a physical seed, so he and Sarah took things into their own hands and ignored the promise of God. That's the story. Okay? This is works-based salvation right here. God has provided... Look, God has provided salvation through His Son. He did it all Himself. And through faith, we, faith in that, we are Abraham's promised children. Look at verse 28. Now we, this is what he says, brethren as Isaac was, are the children of promise. That's how. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, so it is now. And the allegory continues. Turn to Genesis chapter 16. So here we have, I mean, Ishmael is born. He's born, he's, you know, he's a child of Abraham's. He's the one born after the flesh. And the one born of the promise was Isaac. It doesn't mean that they're any more or less of a person. It's just one was God's way and the other was man's way. That's the allegory. Look at Genesis 16, verse number 11. 
And this is again talking, the angel of the Lord talking to Sarai. And it says in Genesis 16, 11, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shall call his name, I'm sorry, this is Hagar, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So that's talking about the type of man that Ishmael is going to be and the nation that he's going to have. Go back to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 30. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 30. The Bible says, Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So, the allegory, again, is this. The bondwoman is man's way. You know, that is the, the path of Hagar and Ishmael. That is man's way, and that represents the covenant. It says the two covenants. That represents the covenants, the covenant at Mount Sinai. It represents the law. It represents salvation through the law. And it leads, look, there's no, here's the thing. It, it's, it's called bond, you know, the bondwoman, bondage, you know, it's called servitude. You know, there's, it's because there's no freedom there. There's no freedom there. There's never going to be any freedom there. Salvation through the law just leads to slavery. That's it. There's not ever going to be salvation. There's not ever going to be freedom through that path. So it says, you know, these two paths can't be together, is what he's saying. Now the promise, the promise, turn to Genesis 17, the promise through Isaac, you know, Sarah's son through Isaac, that's what God promised in the first place. That's what God promised in Genesis chapter 15. That's what God ends up, you know, delivering on. That is God's way. That is the path of grace and the path of salvation without works. And God fulfills His promise. Despite Abram, despite Abram and Sarai taking things into their own hands. The promise of an heir was made twice before this happened in Genesis 16. It was made in Genesis chapter 12 and it was made in Genesis chapter 15. Look at Genesis chapter 17. This is the lesson tonight. This is the lesson tonight. And we'll apply it here in a minute, but look at Genesis 17. See, because, because when Isaac was born, Abram had a son called Ishmael. He was a teenager at that point. I mean, he had a son, and look what he says in verse 17 of Genesis 17. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, this is, he, again, God is telling him he's going to have a child. He said, shall a child be born unto him that is 100 years old? And shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, and Abraham at this point said unto God, oh, that Ishmael, like, Ishmael like, might live before me. He's like, just make it Ishmael. He's like, fulfill the promise through Ishmael. Which, you know, if you think about it, I mean, the son was already there. You know, he had a son. He wasn't barren anymore. I mean, he's like, just, just fulfill the promise through him. Make him a great nation. This is what he's saying in verse number 18. But what would that really, that kind of wreck the allegory, wouldn't it? That kind of wrecked the allegory because it could be kind of like, kind of like Abram had some, something to do with it and Sarah had something to do with it, and then God came in and kind of just helped it along. It'd basically be like man's way and God's way working together, but God said, no, my way, my way. And God said, verse 19, again, he says this. He's like, how many times do I have to say this? And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So God says, no. He's like, it's my way. It's going to be my way despite what you did, despite what you tried, despite you not, really what it was, was kind of lack of faith, not believing that God was actually going to provide him a son. God had to get really specific and say, look, it's going to be Sarah that's going to bear a son. It's not going to be your way. It's this way. Turn to Proverbs chapter 29. 
So we see that this is the allegory. It's the allegory of the bondwoman and the free woman, and that is the law versus the true gospel. It's bondage versus freedom. There is no salvation in man's way. And it makes sense because, I mean, if you logically think through it, there's no possible way that, you know, following the law could ever make you not guilty of breaking the law. I mean, it can't take that away. Turn to Proverbs chapter 29. So what's the application here? We see a great allegory that Paul, again, this is what Jesus was telling, teaching Paul in Arabia. This kind of stuff. These kind of connections to what God's plan was and the different pictures that God was painting in the Old Testament and to what He would fulfill in the New Testament. So what's the application? Turn to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 18. The application I want to make this evening is this. First of all, in Proverbs chapter 29, look at verse number 18. The Bible says this. It says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law happy is he. So look at the first part of that verse there. It says, where there's no vision, the people perish. So first of all, you saw here Abram coming up with his own plan and executing his own plan. But before we get back into that, let me just say this. The Bible even says, look, it's good to have a plan. It's good to have a plan in your life. Okay, there's nothing in the world wrong with having a plan. As a matter of fact, the Bible here is telling us, you know, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a vision, you know, things are not going to be good for you. So it's good to have a plan. You need to have a plan in your life. And whether that be for you, you know, a plan for you personally, maybe if you're not married, don't have a family, maybe that be for your family, if you're married and you have a family, maybe that be a plan, you know, look, if, if you're married and you have a family, you're going to need to have a lot of plans. But I mean, maybe that's for your kids. Look, I mean, you can't, I mean, you can't float through this life day to day and just have no plan. I mean, it's not going to work out. I mean, that's the problem with so many people. Is that, you know, it's just today this and tomorrow that and, you know, whatever. I mean, it's just like, look, where do you want to be in five years? That's the kind of plan I'm talking about. And if you don't know, you know where you're going to be? Right where you are now, or worse, or worse off. So look, this applies to all areas of your life. Having a vision for what you want in your life. Think of your spiritual life. Think of your spiritual life. Think of your church life. Think of, you know, the activities in church. What's your, what's your vision for your role in this church? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, am I the only one that has to think about that? What is your personal vision for what you want your role in this church to be? You know, I, I mentioned things like, just a small example, like men's preaching night. You know, like maybe if you haven't, maybe you want to start getting more involved in the church and in doing things like, you know, getting more involved, like maybe you'll, you'll come to a men's preaching night. Or maybe you'll, you know what, I'm going to preach. I'm going to put a sermon together and I'm going to preach at men's preaching night. You know, maybe, you know, it, it, with, with ladies, it's, it's, it's volunteering for things or coming to events or helping out with events and just helping in certain areas. I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you one thing, not to just go off on this, but I was thinking about, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, the independent church lately. I'm thinking a lot about the independent church that's coming in the next two or three or four months or whenever it is. It's going to be like that. I'm telling you. It's going to be quick. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll know, like, I know the people that had a vision when they came in here into this ministry because I will have a group of people that I know that I can rely on at that point. I will have a group of people who have a vision for what they want to, how they want to be involved in this ministry. I will have that group of people. It's nice. I will have a group of people that I know that I can trust, I can rely on, that I don't have to just go this whole thing alone. And look, by that time, two years, I'll know who those people are. But look, if you think, you know, what's my vision? I would like to be one of those people. You have to have a vision for your spiritual life. You have to have a vision for, you know, your involvement in this ministry. You have to have a vision for that. Well, I mean, what's your vision, you know, what's your vision for your kids? What's your vision for the schooling for your kids? What's the vision for, you know, the future for your kids? What's your vision there? Do you have a vision? Do you have a vision for your kids? 
I mean, you better have a vision for your kids. Or, you know, what about, I mean, I mean, what about things like, you know, your finances? What about, what's your vision there? You know, ways to save money. Are you just flopping by day by day? You know, are you just, you know, day by day spending everything that you have? No plan, no vision, no budget, just whatever, every single day. I mean, look, you're going to perish if, in that area if you have no vision, the Bible says. How about, you know, you know, in five years in these areas, if you have no vision for it, you're going to be where you are now or worse. Well, how about your job? How about your job? Turn to Daniel chapter 1. I've been thinking about this one a lot lately. And I've been reminding myself about this one too. But look, here's the thing about visions. Here's the thing about visions, folks. And I remind myself about this all the time, or especially, you know, at harder times. Like, visions... They don't change with emotions. Visions don't change with just how you feel. Visions don't just, you know, well, today, you know, today I feel like this, and, you know, today I, I don't, and today I don't feel like doing this, and today, you know, that's not, th th there's no vision there. There's no vision there. Here's what it takes. Daniel's one of my favorite people in the Bible. Maybe the favorite person in the Bible. Look at Daniel chapter 1 and verse number 8. Just been taken into captivity. He had gotten brought into the king's house as, you know, to be one of the wise men, to be one of the advisors of the king, you know, to be someone who educated the king's family and the royal court. And, you know, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, there was food and drink there and all this. Anything you want to eat and drink, I'm sure. I mean, it was the king's food. And this is what was offered to Daniel. You know, look what the Bible says. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Then the story goes on to say that this guy's like, you know what, they're probably just going to kill everybody, you know, if they see that you're not eating. You're not eating right, you know, they're just going to get annoyed, you know, and it could cost everybody their life, including mine. But Daniel, he just purposed his heart, he's just like, I'm just not going to do that. Now I'm just not going to go there. I'm just not going to do it. So look, visions... Goals, they, they just they just don't they, they just you just decide what to do and then you do it no matter how you feel. You do it. I mean you follow through on it. Daniel purposed it in his heart and he followed through on it. And that carried him throughout his entire life. You could tell that kind of character, you know, followed him his whole life. You know, I mean, so I mean, what's your vision at your job? I mean, if you don't have a vision at your job, I feel sorry for your family, first of all. But what's your plan? You know, what, what's your plan to do better? What's your plan to learn more? I mean, you should ask, is your plan, you know, the, is your goal to be an expert in your area, whatever it is? Is that, is that your vision? You know, maybe you could start your own business, you know, all these different things. But look, these things, and this is why a vision can't change every other day. This is why you can't have a vision one day and then have a bad week or a bad month at work and then just drop your vision. Because these visions, like becoming an expert in your field at work, these things take years. Years. It takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything. 10,000 hours. Fact. That's working 40 hours a week, that's four or five years to become an expert in a field at something. Look, what the Bible is telling us is that if you have no vision, if you have no plan, you are going to fail. You are not going to make it. You will not accomplish anything. Now here's the irony of this whole situation. Here's the irony of the whole thing. And, 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 and looking at this thing from the ministry, the irony is just, it's like, it's like blasting me in the face. But the irony is this. Raise your hand if you want to accomplish nothing in your life. No one would ever say, me, I want to accomplish nothing. What do you want to be good at? Nothing. What do you want to, how do you want to have a family? I, I want to just suffer. No one would ever say that. No one would ever say that. Yet, everybody's walking around with no vision. Everybody's walking around with no plan. Everybody's walking around just thinking they're just gonna, they're just gonna blindly fall into, you know, success in life. 
It, it's not going to happen. The Bible tells you it's not going to happen. You have to have a plan. You say, okay, I'm convinced. Okay, good. I've convinced you. Well, there's a catch. There's a catch. See, Abraham, Abraham, he had, Abraham had a plan. Abraham and Sarai, they had a plan. They had a plan how to get a son. And they followed through with that plan, but it was not God's plan. And that's the problem. So the second part of this lesson of this application tonight is this. We need, whatever our plans are, they need to be we need to be operating inside God's plan for our lives. That is the key. That is the trick. Our plan, our vision needs to be within God's plan. You say, how do I, how do I know that? You know, I mean, I mean, God, I mean, God literally spoke to Abraham. I mean, God is not audibly speaking to me. And if he is, come talk to me after church. But look, God is not going to audibly speak to you. You're not going to hear a voice in your head that's not God. If you're hearing voices in your head, it's something else. But the thing is, your plan needs to be inside God's plan. But here's the thing. We have the Bible. We have the whole Bible. This is God's plan for you. Right here, completely. You say, I don't see my name in there. Well, here's how it works, folks. This Bible, this Bible that you're all holding in your hand, it defines the roles and responsibilities in your life to your God, to your family, to your friends, to your wife, to your church, to everything. It defines your roles and responsibilities to everything in your life. And as long as your vision lines up with that, you're good. You say, I, you know, give me some examples. I was thinking about some, some more obvious examples that I've seen the most. I mean, there's infinite examples of this. But here's some examples. Say you have a, my vision is to be, you know, is to, is to, to, you know, for a man. My vision is to become more successful at work. I want to become the boss. You know, I want to make some more money for my family. I want to learn everything about my job. And eventually, I want to start my own business. And I want to get, you know, some more freedom so I can maybe, you know, um, you know spend some more time at church and maybe go on some mission trips in, the, in a few years and, you know, just have some more opportunity for my family. So, I mean, I'm going to work 80 hours a week to get that done. And you can't go to church anymore because you're working so much. And you can't go soul winning anymore because, you know, you're working weekends. Look, not God's plan. It's outside of God's plan. That's an Ishmael. That one is yours. That one's your idea. Don't pin it on God. And that's another thing. People will constantly come up with their own plans that are clearly outside God's plan. And I have to be silent when they're telling me these things. Especially when we're in a group of people and they're like, here's my plan. Uh, Ishmael, Ishmael, Ishmael. And I say, uh, you know, it's, look, it's, uh, if it's outside God's plan, it's not God's plan. It's not God's will. It's yours. You know, I have a, I have a vision to make more money. So I'm going to put my wife to work. I'm going to put the kids in public school. And not God's plan. Not God's plan. That's, that's, that's an Ishmael. That one's yours. You know, I mean, pick, I mean, so many times people will create a vision that, that on its face seems like a good thing. I mean, pick anything. Job, career, homeschooling, financial goals. I mean, this was probably the worst. This was probably the worst that I've seen the most. It's like, man, as soon as I make this much money, then I'm going to, I mean, I'm just going to be obsessed with money for 10 years, and as soon as I get rich, then I'm going to serve the Lord. I, look, brother, I'm doing this so I can help the church. You know, I, I'm pushing so hard in my life and trying to, you know, make so much money and I have three different jobs and all this, and, you know, I just can't be involved right now, but as soon as I make that money, you know, then I'm going to be all spiritual. It's completely outside God's will. And, you know, so don't try to spiritualize things don't try to spiritualize your Ishmaels. Spiritualize your Ishmaels like God just me, needs me to do this right now. 
No, no, God, God wants you to be here. Amen. God wants you to be here. Because look, God's never going to accept the Ishmael. God's never going to bless that. It doesn't even make, I mean, when I make this much money, then I'll get in church, you know, and then, you know, I'll sell out then. Look, God is going to destroy those plants. God is going to destroy those plants. So look, folks, this is so easy. This is so easy. Look, life, life is so easy. Look, at least the decisions. You say life doesn't seem easy sometimes. I agree. It doesn't seem easy sometimes. But here's the thing. The decisions are easy. The decisions in life are easy because you just do what you're supposed to do according to the Bible. That's what you do. Look, you, you, get, you establish, you establish, let's come up with a methodology here. You establish a baseline. You establish a baseline, you get, you know, you get squared away. You get in church. You get your family on the right track. You get the kids out of public school. You have a vision to never put them there. I mean, you get your family set up, you're in a good church, you're out soul winning, you're serving the Lord, you have a plan to support your family, your vision is to work hard every single day, you do all these things, make all the plans in the world then. But when the things come up, now that you have this baseline, when things come up, when opportunity comes up, because look, if, you're, if you get a good, solid, spiritual baseline, opportunity is going to pop itself open to you. Doors are going to be open left and right. But look, you better watch out for those doors that are Ishmael's and not God's doors. Because those doors are going to open too. Especially when you get a good baseline. Especially when you get your family on the right track. Especially when you start doing something with your life that is affecting this spiritual battle in this world. The devil's going to open up the wrong doors for you. He's going to try to get you to walk through a couple Ishmael doors. Maybe you're working real hard and you're getting to be the boss and you become the boss and the boss and the boss and the boss's boss. And all of a sudden, that becomes who you are. And all of a sudden, you know, the things of the Lord become small and that becomes the goal. You start putting the horse, the cart in front of the horse. I got my cart and horse mixed up there for a second. But look, you got to be careful, but you got to get a solid, it's all about the solid baseline. It's all about getting that baseline. You get into a good church, you get your family on the right track, you get some, you understand what the Bible says, you listen to, you know, some Bible preaching, you're getting the Bible thrown in your face three times a week, and then look, when something pops up that's not of God, it's going to be very obvious. It's going to be very obvious. But look, anything that would derail that baseline once you have it, you know that's not of God. That's how you know. But you must understand what God's plan is and isn't. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Because, you know, if you have the baseline, you'll understand, you know, what God's plan is, and you'll recognize when something is not God's plan, but if you don't have the baseline, it's going to be tough to recognize what's what. That's how you get these people. They're just like, it, they're just going in every direction all the time. What are you doing this week? I don't know. It's, it's just different all the time. You know, these are the people, I mean, they can't, these are, this is, these are the unstable people. They don't have the baseline. They don't recognize, they don't recognize these things. So they're, they're, they're just walking through doors. I mean, think of it. Think of if you're a saved person and think of how easy this is. It's like a, it's like a shooting gallery for Satan. I mean, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. How many more analogies do I need to come up with here? Because you're just, you're just this Christian, you know nothing, you have no baseline, you're just walking through doors, walking through doors, walking through doors, and I'm sure they're all the wrong doors. Because you, no, you have no base. This is the importance of a Bible preaching church. It's the importance of reading your Bible, of gaining that knowledge and wisdom. This is the, look, this is the allegory of Abraham. A man, a man forcing his plans on God's vision for his life. That's the allegory. God has a plan for you. He wants you here. He wants you in his word. He has a model for you to follow. And look, he'll open doors along the way for you to realize this plan. 
And you should recognize what those doors are. And, and don't go around walking through Ishmael doors or kicking in doors on your own, like Abraham did, or Abram. Galatians, look. Galatians, Galatians and what Paul is talking about here, the Galatians, this works salvation, this works-based salvation is man forcing his solution on a problem that God has already solved. That is what Galatians chapter 4 is about. And it applies directly to all of our lives. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.